feel. There we go. Okay, well, good morning. Welcome to the first in our series of Lockdown Lives. This morning, I'm going to be talking to you about online working, identifying how we can make it physiotherapy when we are online and when we're faced with the restrictions in resources that we are um, dealing with in the uh, global pandemic crisis. So my name is Jo McMeekin. I am a children's physio and I work both face-to-face -face and offer online services for families. And over the last year, I've expanded what I do online. So today I want to really share what I've learned in order that you as families can take forward some of that learning and make the most of the opportunities that are open and available to us um, with regards to online working. And for any of you whose consultations, be it physiotherapy or um, with your paediatrician or uh, orthopaedic surgeon, for example, or any other professionals, any of those that have, removed, that have moved to remote um, working. So I know for many people, they're having telephone consultations or um, online sessions on Zoom uh, with therapists, but many therapists and many services are now resuming face-to-face -face, um, working as well. Um, but despite that, we're still sort of faced with these issues around redeployment of NHS staff in particular, um, managing uh, risks, so some access to settings, including some schools, not every school, but some schools have got limited access um, as well to, uh, to allowing professionals into school um, and some of the access to classrooms or to the same resources that, that would normally be available to us has been drastically reduced. Not only that, but what we are finding is although a lot of therapy services are getting back to face-to-face -face working, there is a backlog um, and there have been cancellations of surgeries or kind of re-cancellations of surgeries or um, uh, kind of extra appointments that have been spread out, spaced out across longer periods of time um, with maybe some a lack of clarity about when they might happen and what we're going to do about it. Um, so there's been this massive move to online and remote working for all of us, I think, across the country, but particularly in healthcare. Um, it's something that we continue to be really uh, aware of because we're, we're working in such close proximity with your children. Um, and obviously that brings a number of challenges, but it also brings with it loads of amazing opportunities. Um, and I, for one, have learned tons as a professional working online. And I've definitely spent a lot of time tweaking the services that I provide. And I will continue to tweak the services that I provide. Um, but in many respects, it enables to, it enables us to receive therapy within our own home or receive updates, information and access to services in a much more flexible way, which can only be positive. However, physiotherapy as a profession, when we um, deliver services traditionally, we are delivering services in a very hands on way. And there is an element that we lose with that with online working. So it's something that both professionally we have to be really aware of, but also for you guys as parents and families, I think it's really important that you are aware of the limitations of our online working or those distance consultations, be them over the phone or uh, video consultations via Zoom, however they may be set up. If you have got access to remote working, we need to make sure that you're able to keep um, on top of exactly what your clinicians need to know because you guys as parents are there um, at the front line able to recognize change or pick up on change much much better and much quicker um, than some of us are as professionals when access to face-to-face -face services is reduced or limited or perhaps there's a bigger gap between um, that service provision. So um, and I think really those services are going to continue to fluctuate in the near future. You know, although we've got access to the vaccine, I think over the coming months and perhaps even for the next 12 plus months, I think access and provision and the way that our traditional services look has probably changed on in the long term and will continue to change for the long term. And some, some of that because of the positives that have come out of the flexible working. But with that in mind, I think the way that we approach practice um, and the way that you guys approach your access to practice as parents um, has to change as well. So how do we do it? How do we keep that safe? Um, it's a really difficult question, isn't it? Because in hands-on practice, traditionally, when I go in to assess a child, um, one of the first things I do is just to sit back and observe. 
um, whilst you know we're having a catch up between myself and parents and family members I spend a lot of time observing what that child's doing I take a lot of things in and I begin to kind of evaluate movement patterns and look at what's happening um, and when you're working either on a screen you are limited to the environment that you're looking at you may have to manage the environment professionally a little bit differently um, and you can't necessarily see children move in the same way um, but not only that we um, some of those consultations are taking place over the phone so we're missing some of those observation skills um, in addition to that one of the other things that is really different with online working is my ability to get my hands on and actually feel how a child is moving or feel how their muscle tone is perhaps and that can change day to day or month to month um, but as parents you're really well placed to be picking up on that and be picking up on that change um, because you're the ones who are handling your children day to day and that's very much the case whether we're working face to face or online with you um, so we're kind of missing a few opportunities and we need to work out how to fill in those blanks so what can you be doing at home to pick up uh, that change and support your child with physiotherapy well whatever happens for face-to-face -face work, we should absolutely be prioritizing annual MOTs. So these, um, if your child has a diagnosis of um, cerebral palsy, this would be in the form of your CPIP assessments, um, which should be taking place at least once a year. For some ch children, they might take place um, twice a year, depending on um, where your child is sitting within that CPIP assessment. But if your CPIP assessment is something that you're thinking back and thinking, actually, has that been longer than a year or are we approaching that 12 month marker then my big recommendation is prioritize that for face-to-face -face services you know chase that and ask for that of your nhs professionals um, in order that if you don't have access to private services um, or if you really want a really big overview because those, that big overview is really important not just the day-to-day -day checks that big overview where we're making a point of checking in but we're making a point of recording the ranges of movement and and keeping a track of any changes that are happening that's imperative for keeping on top of things and making sure that we're prioritizing access to orthopedics orthotics and other services um, in order that we can prevent deterioration and change. So one of the biggest things that, my recommend, that I would recommend to you to chase and to check up on are your CPIP assessments or making sure that your child has got some sort of annual face-to-face -face review. We know that face-to-face -face, um, appointments are taking place. So if you're gonna ask for anything, make that one of your big priorities and make sure that they're having a full range of movement check. A range of movement checks allow us to really put into context what we're seeing and what we're evaluating. So when we can get hands on and when we can feel for muscle tone and we can check the changes that are happening um, with muscle lengths as well, then um, we also know that our observations fit what we're seeing so we can make sense of, well, that muscle's tight there or there's tone kicking in there, which is why that heel's not going down or why perhaps the um, position has changed and that child's crouching a little bit more in their gait pattern. So it, it adds a little piece of the puzzle um, to what we're seeing. But if we've got an overview of what's happened or what is happening across the course of the body for muscle tone and for muscle length, it means that when we come to look at things virtually, if we have to withdraw to virtual services again, all of that con is in context of the range of movement assessments that we've done and the muscle tone that we've picked up. Um, and it also gives you a baseline of something to work on to pick up change and deterioration when you are getting hands on and when you are delivering any stretches or movements, for example. So prioritising your range of movement checks, your big annual range of movement checks with your professionals is something that I would really recommend chasing up. Um, for face-to-face -face services and if it has been close to a year make sure that you've got something booked in make sure that you're clear on what your um, provision is for checking up on those things as well sometimes as parents though it is difficult so although you're getting hands-on every day with your child in one way shape or form even if it's literally just to pick them up carry them move them support them cuddle them it can be difficult for you to pick up change when you see them day to day 
And sometimes the beauty of having your professionals come in with a period of time where there's a gap is that they can detect change easier than when there's been a slow deterioration or slow change that's happened. Um, and I think that sometimes picking up deterioration, unless it's a drastic change and a drastic deterioration, I think sometimes that can be more of a challenge for you to pick up until we get to the point that we really notice that change um, and pick up those early warning signs um, than picking up the progress. I think we're really good at picking up progress and saying, actually, they couldn't do that before, but there may be elements that we need to keep an eye on and safeguard that deterioration or safeguard that change. So um, the other recommendation that I would make is to take pictures and to take videos and be quite specific about how you're doing that. Book it into your calendar if you need to. One of the things, um, one of the triggers that I think is really useful are the half term holidays. We often have a bit of time off work or a bit more time with the kids to be able to flex that in as well during those times. So if you are, um, if you are able to, I would set yourself up for a five minute, 10 minute bit of video footage and picture taking and keep it all in a file, um, nice and safe or an album on your phone, for example, um, or perhaps onto a virtual drive. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but if you can do it every half term or every long term, you're keeping up on that, um, keeping a, an eye on that change and um, able to pick up on it in a much more kind of measured way. So setting alarms, setting, put, putting something in your calendar to remind you just to do some videos and some pictures. Um, I would recommend doing them with and without orthotics because the difference between the two is also really important. And what I recommend as part of my online consultations for that physical assessment, that observation side of things, I use the pictures and the videos to do the observation um, aspect for me so that I have a chance to look at those beforehand um, so that it really helps me when I come to do um, the subject of the discussion side of things and the recommendation. So you want to be doing those in walking and in standing, okay? So for the walking footage, you wanna be taking it um, down a corridor, for example, or through a space where you know that your child can take a really good series of steps with or without a walking device, perhaps, um, if they are up and, and stepping. Um, if not, just taking these um, pictures or videos with them supported in standing is absolutely fine. You wanna be taking it from the front, so seeing them face on coming towards you. And then you want to be taking it from behind as well. So they're moving away from you or standing away from you. And then you also want to find an opportunity to do it side to side as well. So you have them moving in either direction, coming back um, and forth past you on the left side of their body and on the right side of their body so that you have an opportunity to observe from the side and you want to get the head in all the way down to the feet. OK, so it's really important about what's happening throughout the whole of the body. Particularly, I think often we have a focus on what's happening with the lower limb when we're concentrating on gait, um, but actually getting the whole of the body in. And when I do my gait analysis assessments, I look at whole of body because what's happening in the trunk and what's happening in the pelvis tells me an awful lot about what's happening with the rest of the body too. So moving away, um, moving, sorry, moving towards you, moving away, and then from side to side with the left and the right sides of the body. Um, are really important aspects to be looking at. And you want to do the same for your still images as well. Um, if upper limb is a particular concern, then just take a little video as well of them doing something, probably something quite functional, perhaps eating or playing with some toys um, with hands. And again, trying to get from different angles um, can be really, really useful. So using video footage and using pictures so that you can track change as a parent and then flag it up with your professionals if you need to. But the other thing that's useful about this is that you kind of empower and arm yourself with a bit of knowledge um, about what's going on. And it makes it more specific for asking, well, actually, I've noticed that this has changed and this is what I need. Um, so that you can go to both school or your health professionals and say, this is exactly what I've spotted. Um, I don't know what I need to do about it, but I do know who I need in my toolkit to be able to access that. Um, but as part of any online consultations or um, uh, remote consultations where they're perhaps on the phone, I would recommend if you can save these to a cloud or a drive of some sort and make that available to certain professionals or to share it as part of a link on an email before you have a telephone consultation or an online consultation with somebody, 
and that can be really useful. So if you've not got access to WhatsApp or it's tricky to send something as big as that via email to your professionals, then just sending a link on a drive can be really useful. And for me as a professional, I would really struggle with on online and remote working if I if I didn't have the ability to observe and evaluate those movement patterns and look at exactly what was happening with that child. Um, so it's a useful way of you tracking change for yourself and knowing when you need to push people to say, actually, I need to make a change here or, or my child really does need a review because I don't think that heel's touching the floor or actually they're a lot more crouched or a bit more slumped in their um, kid walk or their walker, for example. Um, and I've noticed a bit of a change here. As well as you getting hands on with your child, doing your sort of stretches and your movements that you would normally do and really just taking note once in a while of how they feel. Um, you know, does it feel tighter? How does it feel to maybe a month ago? Not sure, but something in my gut's telling me that we might be getting a bit tighter or I'm gonna need to keep an eye on that for the next couple of weeks. Um, if you can, if you can do those videos and pictures with them undressed or at least wearing sort of shorts and a fairly tight t-shirt or a vest or something, it makes it so much easier to make those observations. So what they're wearing is also really important. Um, but taking the time to observe them when they're kind of undressed. If your kids are anything like my kids, they will spend the majority of their time when they are home learning or if we're in, lock in lockdown, for example, either in their pants or coming in and out of their pants and their onesies. It's a great opportunity if your kids are um, sat around in their pants to actually make those observations of what the spine looks like, what their chest looks like, how their limbs are looking. Um, because we can see it skin like skin to skin on skin can't we it makes it it's made this, it makes those observations much much easier um, so taking the time to observe and making um, the opportunities to spot change and then chasing your professionals up but um, filling in the gaps with some video footage and some pictures can be so useful such a useful tool for your professionals and it's a really fundamental part of the online assessments that I do I will ask for pictures and videos beforehand. I'll review them before my consultations and I'll go back and I'll ask for more footage in a different way if I think there's some bits and bobs that need tweaking or that I need to look at in a bit more detail. Okay, so um, the other thing that I would recommend as well is making the most of stuff like this, like the free webinars um, and free resources that are available online. There's tons of them about now. You know, the beauty of moving to online working as professionals means that it's kind of opened doors to us for access, um, particularly in the private world, to families that we would otherwise not reach. And as a result, there's loads of resources, loads of little tips, information, advice available online. So if you can make yourself... Um, and you can put those in your path, be it on Facebook, on Instagram, or, um, you know, listening to this sort of stuff or watching this sort of stuff, um, then it kind of puts these things uppermost in your mind and helps you to push or ask for things from your professionals or chase things, making sure that you've got the right bits of kit in your toolkit to support your child. So it kind of increases your motivation um, and keeps ourselves accountable, both as professionals and as parents, to make sure um, that when things are as chaotic and as busy and crazy as they are now, that we're keeping on top of it. So making the most of things uh, like online resources is exactly why I um, started the Therapy Toolkit Hub, was to be able to support parents, to be empowered and armed with some knowledge so that they could go out and get exactly what they needed or start to make those observations for themselves. Because you're in day to day with your children, you know them best. You are your child's biggest advocate. I've said it before and I'll say it a million times again, I'm sure. Um, but these opportunities provide little moments to find out what resonates with you. What is it that you're picking up on that is kind of giving that niggling doubt or that moment in your mind where you're saying, I need to get that checked. So listen into that and trust your gut instincts. Okay, so those are kind of my top tips for making the most of online working and navigating services as they move to remote working or online working, um, or as we reduce access to our traditional resources with our appointments both in and out of the NHS. You know, it's fantastic that we still have an opportunity to be accessing face-to-face -face services and that many of these are continuing. 
But as the R rate fluctuates and as things like um, access to school changes, it's really important that we're aware of how these changes are likely to impact on the way that we assess and what we're missing. And it, there are some really simple ways that as parents at home, you can fill in the gaps, um, even if your professional hasn't asked for it. So the final thing to say is to make the most of your energetic resources. And I know I talk about this a lot, but well-being really has to come central to what you provide for your child. You know, unless we um, fill up our own cup, we cannot support our children the best way possible. So in all of this, crazy haze of lockdown and home learning and everything else that comes with it please do look after yourself and prioritize an element of self-care as well um karen bradley the incredible karen bradley i just loved her talk in the therapy toolkit hub so she was my guest speaker the other week um last week in fact um, and she talked about self-care and one of the things that she mentioned is prioritizing micro moments for self-care <clears throat> excuse me so finding these little mini opportunities to take a breather, to open the window, to take a couple of breath, deep breaths um, in and among the chaos, in and among the um, time that you have where you're all piled in together um, in your houses, trying to keep each other alive, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but do remember that you are not an endless supply of energy and resource and you do need to take care of yourselves as well. So prioritise yourself and the rest of it will fit into place. But hopefully a few little top tips for you for online working. Um, if you have any questions, I will now answer them below in the comments. So do let me know. Massive thanks for watching. And I will catch up with you all soon.